I'd like to uh, introduce myself. I'm Laura Singletary, and I'm the moderator for today's hot topic for the League of Women Voters. And we really appreciate y'all joining us today to hear a little bit about uh, some of the work that our, our my dear friend, Dr. Lindsay Dubbs, is uh, doing for us today. So I'd like to take a moment and just tell you a little bit about Zoom. You, if you're not muted as you come in, please go ahead and mute yourselves. And you can may want to put it onto speaker view so that you see a large uh, window of the per person who is speaking there. And so uh, with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Lindsay. Uh, and the League welcomes you and, and for joining our event featuring Dr. Lindsay Dubs. Lindsay wears many hats. One of them is co-director for the University of North Carolina Institute for the Environmental, uh, of the Environment with the Outer Banks Field Study Site. That's hosted by Coastal Studies Institute, CSI. She's also Associate Director for the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program. And she was one of nine women across the United States that received uh, a recent uh, award by the US Department of Energy for Clean Energy and Empowerment. And Lindsay's specialty was for education. And so today, Dr. Dubs is taking time away from testing. She's actually out on Jeanette's Pier this morning, and she's taking time away from the field testing to share just a tiny bit of her research and the activities that she is doing. So I want to thank you again on behalf of the League of Women Voters for all of you joining us today. Like I said, please mute yourself if we, if as you come in. And also, if you have a question, Dr. Dubbs is gonna give us a presentation and we'll, we'll be taking some questions at the end. So you can put it into the chat and we'll try to cover a lot of the questions that you have for us. So with that, Lindsay, if you would unmute yourself and let, please don't, uh, it, say, get going and thank you so much. Sure, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you um, to the League for inviting me and advertising this so heavily. I was surprised how many times I saw it advertised. So um, thank you. I'm excited to talk to you about my work and I'm really flattered that you would like to hear about it. Um, I am going to start, start sharing my screen and um, like Laura said, I hope that we have plenty of time for questions and discussion afterward. Okay, so um, the, the title of this talk um, came from the award that I um, was recently um, awarded, the Clean Energy Education and Empowerment Award. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I do at the Coastal Studies Institute that, and the UNC Chapel Hill Outer Banks field site um, that had me nominated for that award and that I guess I was, I was deemed um, a mid-career uh, woman award winner <laughs> for education and clean energy. Um, I am at Jeanette's Pier right now, so I'm sorry if I'm a, I'm a little more scattered than I would normally be, I think, um, because we are in the middle of some deployment activities. Uh, I wish I could be doing this presentation from the end of the pier that, so that you could see it, but we'll get to that in just a minute. So as Laura said, um, I was one of nine women who, who was um, awarded a Clean Education and Empowerment, or C3E award, and that is a program um, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, MIT, Stanford, and Texas A&M Energy Institute to help to close the gender gap and increase participation, leadership, and success of women in clean energy fields. And 
it really has been an honor and also a great opportunity for me to meet um, men and women in clean energy as a result of this award. I'm really looking forward to having an in-person um, symposium soon. It was a Zoom symposium uh, when I received the award in December. Um, so these awards are given to mid-career women and also there's one lifetime achievement award given. So these are women who are doing clean energy work um, for international efforts, um, for research, government, entrepreneurship, or in my case, education. And so I do have several different jobs um, associated with several different institutions, but um, the locus of each of them is here at the Coastal Studies Institute um, on Roanoke Island. Um, the Coastal Studies Institute is a multi-institutional partnership led by East Carolina University and uh, also with UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina State University, and UNC Wilmington, as well as Elizabeth City State University. And the Coastal Studies Institute has been a really wonderful place for me to work for, gosh, it's been 12-ish years now, um, because it really has provided so many opportunities to, um, to pursue my curiosity about a lot of different subjects. So I have a fly friend here, so excuse me. Um, the Coastal Studies Institute has provided me opportunities to interact with the public quite a bit, to interact with students quite a bit, and to do really interesting coastal research and also renewable energy research. So one of my jobs at the Coastal Studies Institute is related to the Outer Banks field site. And the Outer Banks field site is a place-based immersive multidisciplinary curriculum. Um, I have colleagues, Linda Dana, who is a human ecologist. She does human dimensions research. And then colleagues, Andy Keeler, who is an economist, and Lee Lighty, who is a lawyer. And we um, teach for the Outer Banks field site. It's a 17 credit hour fall semester. And the wonderful thing about the Outer Banks field site is that it is very place-based. So we get to immerse the students in the natural and the human communities of the Outer Banks. The students all do an internship um, with a local organization um, while they're here. And they also do a group research project of local relevance. Um, we also have a community advisory board that provides local knowledge, advice, and connections for the students. And so these are pictures of, few, of a few of the opportunities that the students um, have to get out and learn more about, on the bottom left, water quality in Monchies Harbor. They were doing an, a um, hydrology lesson in, in this picture. They were analyzing water quality samples from their capstone project on septic systems here in the laboratory. They, we try and visit, um, if they have time to talk with us, the um, Wanchis Trawl and Supply, where they talk to us about different fishing gear. And then this is a ghost crab survey actually at Jeanette's Pier, where I'm speaking to you from right now. So this, this part of my job has me interacting with undergraduate students and with the community, um, empowering these students, educating them. There isn't a huge focus on energy with this curriculum, but it always kind of comes into play because energy is a really important environmental topic. Um, this comprises about one third of, of my job responsibilities, um, directing and um, teaching classes for the Outer Banks field site. The other um, big emphasis of my work at the Coastal Studies Institute is related to the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program which is a state program that was funded by the North Carolina legislature back in 2010. And it provides funding to conduct research, to conceptualize, design, construct, operate, and market new and innovative technologies using renewable ocean energy. And I'm really proud of this, um, of this program because not only do we focus on harvesting um, energy from waves, tidal currents, ocean currents, and thermal gradients, but we also have this part where we 
are using renewable ocean energy wisely. And that means that one of our priorities is understanding what the environmental impacts and what the human use conflicts might be with these marine hydrokinetic energy devices. So one of the reasons why we're interested in marine renewable energy is because there are vast resources available within United States waters. So this figure is showing us the resources available um, in the United States and then some, some island states. Um, this is from a recently released uh, report from the National Renewable Energy Lab. And you can see that these resources are wave energy resources, tidal energy resources, ocean current energy resources, ocean thermal resources, and river resources. And so off the coast of North Carolina, our primary resources that are substantial enough to really harness and utilize for either grid scale applications or what are called blue economy applications that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute are wave energy, that's what the blue is showing us, and also ocean current energy. And across the United States, that marine energy, those marine energy resources, if we consider all of the technical capacity, that's not, that doesn't take into account places where there are protected areas or there could be some sort of environmental conflict that we um, don't want to make the, take the risk of putting devices there, just considering the technical capacity, it could um, provide 50% of the electricity generated at utility scale for the United States. So there is this vast um, energy resource out there, renewable energy resource. And just to give you an idea of what these devices that harness the renewable energy resources look like, these are some of the classes of wave energy devices. You can see that they kind of move in different orientations relative to wave directions. Some of them are located at the surface of the water, and some of them, like the surge converter, are located on the bottom of the water column. Some of them, like the water, the overtopping terminator, basically have the water come in the top and run through a turbine um, back to the elevation at the, at the base of the wave. Um, and then if we look at current energy technologies, and these can be utilized both for tidal currents coming through inlets, for instance, or for ocean currents at a much larger scale, like the Gulf Stream off of our coast, we also have lots of different orientations, lots of movements relative to the primary flow of the water. And as I mentioned, um, the Department of Energy and, and um, maritime economies have recently been focusing on not only grid scale electricity, so providing electricity for us to turn on the lights, but also these alternative blue economy applications that would require smaller energy sources. So those include power at sea, so ocean observing, um, underwater vehicle charging, marine algae, aquaculturing algae, um, offshore marine aquaculture for fish, and seawater mining, as well as resilient coastal communities. And that includes desalination, um, helping to serve isolated communities that otherwise are using gas power generators and trucking all of the, that gasoline into their communities, and also for coastal resiliency and disaster response. So um, the challenges of, well, the challenges of the marine energy sector are many. I mean, you all, I assume, are local here to the Outer Banks, um, and you know that the ocean is very powerful. It is very corrosive. Things rust here. Um, it's also somewhat unpredictable. We sometimes get these really high energy events that are difficult to um, predict and predict the effects on infrastructure. Um, so the Ocean Energy Program, the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program is really trying to help address some of those challenges faced by the, sec by the sector. 
And some of those are funding research projects that are being done by researchers at North Carolina State University, um, NC a and University and UNC Charlotte. Those are our partner universities with the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program. But then another, th that another thing that we do focused at the Coastal Studies Institute is this partnership with Jeanette's Pier and the town of Naxhead to um, have a test facility located at Jeanette's Pier. And we have very few open ocean test facilities in the United States available. Um, and those test facilities are really important to move from devices that like the classes that I showed you before in things like wave tanks or theoretical um, models of devices, actually putting them into the ocean allows for the devices to be optimized. It allows us to understand how the ocean environment is going to um, require um, maintenance of those devices. And it also allows us to think about the interactions with the environment, ecology, and existing human uses. So this, this facility, this infrastructure of a pier is really wonderful because um, it is crossing the beach into the near shore environment. And so that really helps um, us to reduce a lot of the risks of environmental actions and um, competing with other human uses. And so the permitting process is a bit, little bit easier. Um, and also it allows us um, a lot of interaction with the public. We have been talking to the public all day today about what we're doing and that talking with public, giving them information is really that education of those people is empowering them to understand what these devices look like and how they can help um, maritime applications and perhaps provide electricity for our grid down, down the road. So the test facility basically has two test berth areas. Um, one of them marked by this near shore test mooring. There's actually one on the north side of the pier and one on the south side of the pier. And they're 50 meter square areas where we can test devices. We also have an offshore test mooring that we haven't used yet. And that is located next to an acoustic wave and current profiler. And that acoustic wave and current profiler, as well as some observation um, wave observing buoys that my colleague Mike Melia installed, um, are providing information that will be really useful for, wait, for developers to understand this wave climate to optimize devices for this area. So we have um, done a few deployments in the past here from Jeanette's Pier. At the top, you can see a, the Resolute, Resolute Marine Energy Surge WEC um, that was deployed from Jeanette's Pier using a crane in 2000, 2011. And this Surge WEC is those bottom mounted devices that kind of move like this with the waves that you saw in the animations previously. And then this um, buoy is a wave power desalination buoy. And it's really cool, this, this um, device was actually created by two uh, UNC Charlotte uh, engineering students as their master's thesis project. And they created this company and they recently transferred everything from this company, all of the rights associated with the company to um, another group that has taken that over. And I'm gonna refer back to them in a minute. Um, we've, we've also done some testing of other um, observing devices at Jeanette's Pier. We did a Scott scour monitor validation for Nortec in 2013. And in two, another, um, we also tested another uh, device called an in-situ erosion evaluation probe that was created by NC State. So this partnership with Jeanette's Pier has been really wonderful. They also have a great education staff here um, with whom our education and outreach staff works very closely. So the um, reason that I am here at Jeanette's Pier today is because Jeanette's Pier was selected as the location to host the final drink stage of the Waves to Water Prize, which is um, one of the prizes that the Department of Energy is 
uh, offering under a series called American Made Challenges. So they basically are having these contests where people to help spur innovation, um, especially surrounding renewable energy on um, and its application to uh, blue, blue economy purposes. So basically this Waves to Water Prize is just as it said, focused on using the movement of water and waves to desalinate seawater to drinking water. And this shows the deployment areas that we will be deploying the devices. And this arrow indicates the, um, the prevailing wind direction um, in April. So we are here today. We are actually, as far as the Waves to Water Prize goes, we are in the create stage. And when I say we, I mean the competitors who are actually designing these devices. And that SAR buoy that I mentioned before has actually transferred to um, another group and they are entering that device into this prize. And so right now there are 10 groups of competitors who are designing, designing these devices. They've made it through these other stages where they're basically just um, providing information about their concept of wave power desalination. Um, they're then modeling those devices um, adapting them for the Jeanette's Pier test site specifically. And then now a lot of them are creating prototypes, small um, prototypes of their devices. And eventually what the, there will be three to five groups that bring their devices here to Jeanette's Pier. They will be deployed um, in these test areas and they'll be competing for half a million dollars um, for the, a, a bunch of different prizes. So I have a video that I'm gonna show you in a minute that was developed by Department of Energy and um, John McCord and the education staff at the Coastal Studies Institute that tells you more about the prize. But just wanted to tell you while these developers are working on the create stage, there is a lot to be done to prepare for that drink stage. So that includes environmental permitting and that is one of the things that I do. And it also includes making sure that we can safely, without impacting the environment, deploy these devices. And so that's what my colleagues are doing at the end of the pier right now as I speak. Um, there are four divers and lots of people operating cranes and jet skis and all kinds of things. So this drink stage will happen next April of 2022. So I hope that maybe some of you will come here to Jeanette's Pier and observe that, that stage. But let me play this video for you because they explain it much better than I ever could. Access to safe, clean drinking water is essential for coastal communities around the world. The US you know what Department I just realized? I did. I'm going to end the show for a minute and I'm going to unshare my screen and I'm going to reshare because I forgot to tell it to optimize video. Sorry about that. There's always some kind of technical difficulty. Access to safe, clean drinking water is essential for coastal communities around the world. The U.S. Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Laboratories are working with U.S. innovators to provide solutions for drinking water access through ocean-powered desalinization systems through the American Made Challenges Waves to Water Prize. Sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy Water Power Technologies Office, the Waves to Water Prize is a five-stage, $3.3 million contest designed to accelerate the development of small, modular, wave-powered desalinization systems capable of providing potable drinking water in disaster relief scenarios and remote coastal locations. East Carolina University, the Coastal Studies Institute, and Jeanette's Pier have recently partnered with the Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Laboratories to host the final drink stage of the contest in the prong of 2022. During this stage, teams will test their devices over a five-day period in the waters adjacent to Jeanette's Pier. The Coastal Studies Institute is a multi-institutional research and education partnership led by East Carolina University in collaboration with NC State University, UNC Chapel Hill, UNC Wilmington, and Elizabeth City State University. 
CSI operates a renewable energy testing site in partnership with Jeanette's Pier, a North Carolina aquarium's operated facility located in Nags Head, North Carolina. The research experience, technical expertise, and infrastructure available for deployment and testing make CSI and Jeanette's Pier an optimal location in partnership for teams in the drink stage of the Waves to Water products. A cornerstone of our program has been testing wave energy technologies in the real ocean environment at our testing platform at Jeanette's Pier in Nags Head, North Carolina. We're really excited to partner with NREL and Department of Energy and Jeanette's Pier on this game-changing way of coupling wave energy technologies with desalination technologies to deliver safe drinking water to our coastal communities. Jeanette's Pier is extremely excited about hosting the Waves to Water Challenge because along with our partners, the Coastal Studies Institute, we are uniquely situated to handle each and every task that is going to be thrown at us. We have ample natural resources, we have strong educational relationships, we have an outreach opportunity that is more expansive than anything in the Mid-Atlantic. We can reach a quarter of a million to a half million people a year on site with the information that is generated here from this competition. CSI, Jeanette's Pier, and DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory are excited to be hosting this final stage of the competition on North Carolina's Outer Banks. The research experience, technical expertise, outreach potential, and infrastructure available make Jeanette's Pier the ideal location for the device testing stage for the competition. Join us in the spring of 2022 for this exciting final stage of the Waves to Water Prize. Okay, sorry about that. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention before I move on to this other piece of exciting news about our program um, is that these competitors are making these devices and they have to fit within basically a shipping container. And then when they come there, some of them will be inflated before they're deployed. So there are all different types of devices, just like all of those device classes that I showed you. There are all different types of devices, so we're really excited about seeing what the, the innovations will look like, what these designs will look like. Um, and this, this is also a great opportunity for us um, because it helps us prepare for this next um, opportunity that we've been awarded recently. Um, Department of Energy has a series of national uh, renewable energy labs and there's one in Hawaii, there's one on the West Coast, there is one in Florida for Gulf Stream, and the Coastal Studies Institute is part of a four-part university consortium that was just awarded the National Renewable Energy Lab for the Atlantic Coast. So that means that we will be working with our partner universities led by University of New Hampshire in partnership with Stony Brook and Lehigh Universities to conduct research and also to accredit our test facilities. And that means that if a device comes and is tested here, we're basically making sure that it is following very specific protocols so that it is comparable to other types of marine energy devices, reducing risk to help um, reduce the cost of the devices, for instance, to make sure that the environmental impacts are minimized, things like that. So, we are really excited to be part one of these national renewable energy centers and this deployment associated with waves to water and even this practice deployment help us test some of our um, capabilities kind of what we can do from this test facility and also um, how we will be measuring different environmental parameters so i deployed a hydrophone my my role for the Renewable Ocean Energy Program is Associate Director, which means I'm helping with some of the leadership um, of the program, the strategic directions, running our annual symposium, things like that. But I'm also in charge of environmental assessment and permitting. So when we think about down the line being part of this National Energy Center, I am supposed to be making measurements or at least telling, you know, the whole group making decisions about how um, we will make measurements about how these devices might be affecting making changes in the environment. Um, remember. Oh yeah, and so the other thing that the Coastal Studies Institute is really heavily involved with um, for 
the Atlantic Marine Energy Center are these cross-cutting things um, that, that allow us to look across the whole East Coast, to look across the energy sector, and especially focusing on blue economy applications of marine energy. And so one of those, um, my colleague, Linda Dana, who I mentioned before, who I work with at the Outer Banks Field Site, she's leading stakeholder outreach and engagement, and I'm helping with that, as well as our director, George Bonner, who you just heard speak. And we are interested in you. You are stakeholders, we believe. Um, stakeholders just mean someone with an interest or concern in something. And so for us, the, those stakeholder groups related to marine energy include those involved in the sector, like researchers, industry, and government. Um, so people who are actually doing marine energy. Um, and also those who have an interest in the existing uses of the marine environment where marine hydrokinetic installations may be located. So that is where your group probably comes in a lot. Um, that also includes regulatory agencies um, and those who are responsible for upholding legal protections of areas. Um, and also it, you also might be among the group that would be interested in the energy that is generated from marine renewable energy, marine hydrokinetic applications. So please, if you would like to be added to our listserv, um, you can actually, I don't know that this NCROEP listserv started yet, but if you just email me, I can add you at some later date, dubsl at ecu.edu, and I can put that into the chat later. We would love to keep you informed and, and involve you. So as I said, the other aspect of marine renewable energy that I'm responsible for is thinking about the changes that will be introduced to the marine environment by that development and how those specific changes are going to affect the environment and ecology of this place. And so changes when we think about these two actual installations of devices. This is the OPT power buoy. So this is a wave device that basically floats at the top of the water. Um, and then this one is an ocean current company, Magellanus Renewables. They're out of Spain and there are giant turbines underneath this barge. So this is an ocean current harvesting device. Um, so when we, when we think about this development, there are undoubtedly going to be structures that were not there previously. There also will be some sort of moving component of those devices. Um, there will be mooring lines and cables associated with the devices. And there will also be increased vessel traffic as the devices are put into place and then during um, operation and maintenance. And those changes can um, negatively or positively affect our environment. And so my job is to kind of think about what those changes might be. And a lot of them can be mitigated. A lot of them can be reduced by the proper siting of devices. So we are starting to think about that for our region. And that requires us to really understand the distribution of organisms, how they're using spaces, why they're using spaces. So as I said, the changes could create habitat. So all of a sudden you have structures and those almost act like reefs. Those reefs could then attract fish to them. Um, but there's also displacement of habitat. There's dis displacement of water column habitat as well as that sandy habitat. Um, and there are changes in hydrodynamics and those changes in hydrodynamics could affect things like nutrient cycling. Um, so a lot of times there are more nutrients near the bottom of the water column and those could be brought up to the top. That would be beneficial for things like aquaculture, um, especially of marine algae, because those algae um, like those would like those nutrients and it would actually increase their productivity. Um, but it can also cause things like scour changes in hydrodynamics. Moving components can, po can pose a strike risk for some marine organisms. There can also be a reduction in energy. And that is, an, is again, something that could be, um, if properly cited, utilized for human benefit. So energy reduction means that as you're taking that energy out of the water column, there is no longer as much energy behind the devices. So it could 
um, perhaps mitigate erosion, the re reduce erosion of shorelines, for instance. Moving components will also add noise to the marine environment. Um, mooring lines and transmission cables could, could pose a risk for entanglement and also um, emit electromagnetics. So both sound and electromagnetic um, sensory uh, cues are really important for a lot of marine organisms and that's why we're, that's why we're um, concerned about those. Um, and then increased vessel traffic could also introduce noise or pose strike risks. So we're thinking about these things as we're moving forward with um, helping to support the sector. We're also thinking about what these environmental impacts might be. And so one of the, um, one of my foci um, for thinking about that has what it, I basically started by thinking about what we know about marine uh, organisms and especially protected species and those that are really important for the base of our um, food web for the primary producers and the nutrient cycling aspects um, of the food web. And so uh, one of the tools that I've utilized is tagging and tracking sea turtles because I noticed that we don't know very much, especially when we look at the ocean currents, we don't know very much about how sea turtles are using that Gulf Stream current. And as I said, um, the once those structures are put in place and there are moving components, um, there, there could be risk of strike or entanglement. But if the sea turtles aren't using the same space as where the devices will be put, there isn't a risk associated with that. So this great video made by my colleague, John McCord at Coastal Studies Institute a while ago, you'll notice by how different I look, um, is, explains our tagging and tracking, one of our tagging and tracking programs. We are interested in how sea turtles are using the Gulf Stream environment. And so we tagged five juvenile sea turtles that were collected from North Carolina beaches down south and were raised at the Pine Knoll Shores Aquarium until they were the size that we could attach a solar satellite tag to them and release them in the Gulf Stream amongst sargassum. This is filling in one of the major data gaps in the sea turtle life history. These guys are incredibly long-lived and we don't know much about that early time frame that they spend offshore, so we don't know where they go, how they interact with their environment, and so not knowing that makes it more difficult to protect them. A lot of the technologies that were present until recently were too large to be able to tag smaller turtles. And so we're really interested in how those turtles are using the Gulf Stream and the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program is interested in it because if we are to harness Gulf Stream based energy, we need to do so um, responsibly and that means making sure that we protect species that could be at risk of interaction with those turbines, including juvenile sea turtles. It's important because sea turtles are protected under the Endangered Species Act, but they interact with a lot of fisheries. And when you have turtles interacting with human activities, what'll happen is those human activities may be restricted. So the more information that we have, the better targeted our uh, management can be. So we're not just blanket you know, protecting areas or habitat, we can home in on where they're actually going, where they're actually using the habitat, and perhaps release you know, restriction elsewhere. Every time the turtle is at the sea surface, the tag will transmit to overhead satellites. The tags themselves, because they require recharging, they'll be transmitting for about 10 hours, and then they shut down for two days to recharge. But during that 10 hour active period, they're sending all sorts of signals to overhead satellites that then will just send them to somebody's email and computer. So these solar tags are temporary tags. We affix them to the back of a sea turtle with a um, suite of different adhesives, but they are meant to fall off eventually. Sea turtle shells grow as the sea turtle's soft tissues grow. So anything that would be permanently affixed could cause harm to the sea turtle. And so these tags will fall off over time, sometime between immediately after they're put on to 300 days from when they're put on. We're hoping for about 30 days. 
The public can track these sea turtles by going to seaturtle.org. We did have five tags that were transmitting at one time, and you can see the tracks of the tags that are still transmitting now. Projects like this are important because not only is it providing information for our program, for the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program, and maybe supporting the development of Gulf Stream-based energy, but it's also just providing us information about a organism that is really interesting to the general public and is also uh, protected. And so the more that we know about these animals, the more that we can make decisions to help protect them. Okay, so um, that gives you a little bit of background on why we did the tagging. And now I'm gonna share some results with you. But before I do that, you'll notice that here and in probably most of my work, I benefit from collaboration with lots of different researchers and I rely on their expertise. I am not a sea turtle researcher. Um, so it's really fun to be able to work with these different groups of people and collect information that is of interest to all of us to help, as Kate said in that video, help us understand um, where these sea turtles are, are spending most of their time and some ideas of why they're spending time in those places so that we can allow for um, uses of spaces that are not conflicting with them. So um, maybe we're leaving some fishing regulations, for instance. So the turtles, this, this figure on the bottom is gonna show you the track of the juvenile sea turtles and the little black dots, just so you know, are the transmission locations. So Kate was talking about those satellite tags transmitting to a satellite. And these, this information came to my email. So um, we put together this little animation from it. And you can see that the sea turtles stayed within the Gulf Stream. Um, and um, comparing the temperature data from those tags to the surrounding temperatures, um, sorry, I should have told you, this is um, the warm colors are, are corresponding with the warmest temperatures. The cooler colors are colder temperatures. So you can really see the Gulf Stream pretty um, strongly here running along our coast. And so sometimes the turtles kind of spin off in warm core rings and then make their way back to the Gulf Stream over time. Um, the longest transmission that we had of those tags was about 60 days. So they stayed off the continental shelf, they stayed in the Gulf Stream, and they stayed at the surface of the water column. And so when we're talking about Gulf Stream turbines that would probably, unlike the Magellanus Renewables installation, the ones that we have been considering would be located far below the sur surface of the water. So we know that there wouldn't be a conflict with these juvenile sea turtles. Um, and um, up here at the top, these are some loggerheads. Sorry, I shouldn't say all juvenile sea turtles. These were loggerhead sea turtles. We don't know about some of the other. Um, species that are found in our waters. Um, these, uh, data, these data uh, are showing the location of ta three tagged adult loggerheads over time, and the warmer colors are depicting the dates closer to the present. So they were basically released up here, and by October, they made it down to the continental shelf off of North Carolina's coast. So that shows that there could be a conflict between these adult loggerheads um, and wave energy devices located on the continental shelf, especially during the fall through to, or especially um, in the fall and also during nesting seasons. So I was gonna tell you about some other research projects, but I would prefer to leave some time for questions. So I'm gonna hold off on that, but just to bring this back around to um, education and mentorship, uh, you know, I get to speak with the public quite a bit through my role with the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program, which is really fun, but I also, um, and, I, and I love it, and I also get to work with these young people, these, these people that are depicted here are not students. They are recent graduates who've served as technicians in my lab. Um, well, some of them have become students since then, um, but they've been technicians in my lab. And so 
interacting with these people who are coming to my, my lab group from lots of different backgrounds, um, not only educates and empowers them, but it's reciprocal. They definitely bring a lot of ideas to the lab group. And so um, they bring a lot of ideas. They bring, they educate me about things I would have never thought about. So um, this opportunity to involve young people in research is really uh, a wonderful aspect of my work. And with that, I thank you. And I thank um, all these people, as I said, I work with lots of different people through the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program. And I didn't even list Outer Banks field site people here, but um, yeah. So, and thank you all for, again, your interest. I hope um, that you have some questions and that you will keep, um, up with the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program as we have these great new exciting opportunities. Well, thank you, Lindsay. I did try to put, uh, this is Laura for, uh, again, for the rest of the group. Uh, that was very interesting. I had no idea uh, everything that you're involved with. I did try to put those email addresses in seaturtle.org in the chat. And Linda uh, McGee had one question about is uh, Linda's new to us up in Duck, and her question was about I just lost it. Uh, is there any co coordination with the NOAA facility in Duck? There is. We work with the Army Corps of Engineers facility. They will actually be doing some. Um, uh, wave monitoring during the next stage of the waves, waves to water, not during the next stage, the next test of the waves to water prize. And we're hoping that they'll do um, those measurements as well um, for the April 22, 2022 um, contest here. Um, we, they are a wealth of expertise, especially about um, coastal dynamics. So Several of my colleagues um, who are oceanographers and um, geologists and coastal scientists work with them quite a bit. I don't work with them as much, but the first time that I ever deployed a hydrophone, which listens to the sounds in the marine environment, was at the FRF, FRF. the field facility in Dutch. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> sure. um, Judy Lotus has a question about the desalinization project. Was so exciting. What is the principle behind the instrument that you showed us? You showed us several. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. So I think that there are the desal. Judy, I'm assuming that you were asking about how the desalination happens, and there are a couple of different ways. So some of the devices are actually. Um, generating electricity within the device and the electricity is brought to shore and then the water um, is pumped, the seawater is pumped and the desalination happens within a um, desalination system on shore with a, um, a electrical motor that is that the electricity for which is generated by the devices. And then there are also some devices that are actually directly the wave energy has some sort of um, hydraulics that are pushing the, or they're creating a pressure gradient to push the water through the desalination membranes. So there are, again, just like those device classes, there are a diversity of different ways that water can be desalinated. Wow, I'll just kind of follow up on that made me think about uh, we know here on the Outer Banks, we have a desalinization plant and the water is very expensive. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine that one of the goals for all of these new equipment is the costs to help it. And in yeah. the, the DOE video they talked about in, in um, remote locations that were impacted by storms or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yes, this, the, the um, Basically, the, the idea of desalination in coastal locations that require desalinated water, getting electricity directly, locally, basically, um, to for those really high energy um, processes is definitely um, one of the, 
ideas that makes this so exciting because right now wave energy is definitely way more wave or electricity from wave energy is definitely way more expensive than wind energy or solar energy for instance okay we're we got a ways to go yes and this is from someone rosemary rollins Hi, rosemary. <laughs> you make us so proud thank you her question is that you mentioned that students from the obx field site take local internships where do they become interns mm. So um, we have our program because it is that multidisciplinary kind of environmental decision making program. Uh, we often have a lot of placements with local planning departments. So we've had people with Dare County Planning Department, as well as several of the towns. Um, we have them with local non government organizations like um, the Nature Conservancy and the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Um, we've had them with consulting firms, um, the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So um, Jeanette's peer, uh, one of the students who's coming in fall of 2021 recently messaged me that she's really interested in like making infographics and things. So um, some of them are interested. They all come in with these interests. Oh, the, the district attorney's office always takes an intern, which is wonderful. Um, because we have a lot of law students uh, in, that come to the field site as well. And then Coastal Studies Institute, we take a lot of students and involve them in our research projects. And then actually the Unitarian Universalist congregation has a um, intern as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Monica Thibodeau has a question. Thank you. Do you have a specific date for April 2022? Oh my goodness, I wish that we had a specific date, but just like um, this test deployment, it, it is really a lot of the operations of the Coastal Studies Institute that are field operations, especially on the water um, and especially on the ocean, really require a very specific weather window. So fortunately, there are members of our team who are actually avid surfers, and so they pay attention to, you know, when we're going to have swell and um, different uh, types of waves and what the wave heights are going to be and the wave periods. And so this day, I wish that I could carry my computer with me, but I'm wired. Um, this day, if you may, if you have a chance to go out to the ocean, you'll see that it's very flat. It's relatively sunny. It's the perfect day for deployment. So this is what we're going to hope for for April 2022, but we don't know when that will happen. <laughs> Well, uh, as many of you who registered for this program know that we, we had to be flexible because there was a chance that Lindsay wouldn't be available today, that she would be offshore. So one of the questions that I have, Lindsay, is just tell us about like you're on Jeanette's Pier today and you plan to go offshore. So what it, what is this week like for you? Is it typical? Um, no, I wouldn't say typical. It seems like um, a lot of field operations tend to kind of get concentrated. I mean, you know, the winter, um, and I should say, I, I have to give this disclaimer, this disclaimer, going offshore, I rarely go on the boats because I get horribly seasick, but I'm in the laboratory preparing for everyone to bring the samples back from offshore. I'm more of a nuisance than a help um, when I'm with them, but, but this is not really a a typical week, except that there have been very few um, windows where the weather has been conducive to field work until now. And so um, we, um, we've been ramping up for a new set of experiments for the Gulf Stream. Um, and so we're ready for that. And so anytime that there are offshore conditions look good for that, we'll be doing that. And today was a great day for doing this work at Jeanette's Pier. Um, actually, the offshore conditions have deteriorated, so I'm not doing a Gulf Stream cruise this week. Um, and we're hoping to be able to do one next week. Yeah, that's always the, the living on the beach is, is wonderful because it's when you used to visit here, you always knew it was beautiful weather the day you had to leave. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we love living here. And it's such a joy for you to join us today, Lindsay, and 
we can't thank you enough for your time and the research. Uh, you, you talked about your teaching and everything, but you do some very interesting and unique research as well that I know you didn't even get into at all today. But uh, I'll leave a, a, another minute or two in case there are any other questions. The applause, applause. I'm, I'm seeing thank this you, Kathy. from <laughs> Kathy Jorgensen. So we appreciate your time today. And are there any, uh, any other questions people let us know? And uh, any, any thoughts that you have for us, Lindsay, as, as you know, we all love the Outer Banks uh, and we love the interaction with the ocean. Yeah, so I encourage you, if you haven't already connected with the Coastal Studies Institute and East Carolina University Outer Banks campus, please do. We have a great program every month called Meet the Scientist. Um, Hopefully someday soon we'll get, be getting back to um, our biannual uh, open houses. And we have um, just work going on that, that I think would be of interest to your group. So keep, keep thinking about us. And thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you all today. And I hope that um, you'll engage with other researchers here at the Coastal Studies Institute. Well, we've got a couple of more comments besides the applause and the clapping. Uh, Charlotte Pedigo sa says, thank you so much. It was so interesting. And I don't know if it's Gail or Angelo, but Sinesso says wonderful info. Thank you so much. And uh, we all do thank you for joining us today and best of luck to, to you, Lindsay. And be seeing you soon, I guess. Yes. Yeah.